Well, um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm grateful that Edward has given me such a, a, a superb launch pad for the study of a house in the middle of that huge slab of blue clay that we're going to talk about now in, in great depth. So here's Meadow Cottage Weathering Set, and it's a 16th century farmhouse. The first two phases are the, one, are the ones that I want to home in on. And what we're looking at in this first introductory slide is um, a lovely wildflower garden with um, uh, pyramid orchids coming up, so it must be early summer. And the right-hand section of the house, which is probably of about 1600, consisting of a hall in the center and a parlor at the right, which I'm not going to talk about. Next slide, please. Um, this is a little joke for you, but Edward has already kicked off this subject beautifully. I want you to imagine that you're sitting in your favorite uh, South Devon or uh, other West Country, rolling countryside, pastoral, meadowland, hills up way above the horizon, valleys deep in, uh, intersecting into the landscape. And I want you to imagine it completely flattened by some enormous galactic road roller that's flattening the countryside all around you until it's absolutely dead flat, but miraculously it's leaving behind all the meadows, the trees, the cows, the farms and the, the buildings. And here you are in a dead flat version of your favourite pastoral scene. And now you are in High Suffolk, in particular, the very centre of the county. So here on the right is a picture of the flattened rural area we're going to be looking at with still water, small enclosures, rectangular farmhouses, clustered farm buildings, a barn right on the front of the property in this case, but it's a green lane still. So here we are in High Suffolk. Next, please. Here's a similar map to the one that Edward showed you. Look again at the blue. This is boulder clay and the further north, broadly speaking, in Suffolk you are, the flatter this plateau is looking, the more challenging is the drainage and the less is the incision and the, the rolling nature has almost disappeared. So the red X in the middle is weathering set midway between Stowmarket and I. It's very much dairying country. And so next slide, here comes weathering, the, the weathering set area. So as we look um, at this list, I'm trying to describe for you what you see when you are riding your Pulfrey along the roads of, of uh, High Suffolk. A very flat landscape. It's intersected by hedges, by small meadows. Five acres perhaps would be the average size. A very sticky clay soil, challenging drainage, wet ditches everywhere, but the Although the rainfall is low, the water just isn't going anywhere much. And the road that you're traveling down is going to be very muddy. Settlements by and large are scattered in this landscape and a proportion of the farms are actually fronting onto greens and commons. And the, the meadow farmhouse we're looking at will be um, very much constrained by the um, the intersection of roads, which in fact is what a green is in this part of Suffolk. It's, it's a road junction, undisciplined, ill-formed, rutted. People have had a go at going parallel and therefore widening the area of the road. They abandon the really rutted bit and start a new one and then someone else widens it and a road junction becomes enormous. And then in the 13th century, often 
that is the moment that the green is delineated more carefully and ditched and new settlements are placed alongside the green. So you'll find lots of ponds, lots of wet ditches everywhere. Many of them have been there since the Middle Ages. Um, pasture for the cattle um, in the summertime, hedged, uh, very thick, very strong hedges, wet ditches, and driftways, particularly of course for returning to the farmstead for milking, um, hay meadows to feed the stock that survives the winter, looking beautiful in the early summer, and then decapitated and brought in uh, nice and dry for hay for the winter. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next, please. Here they are. These are the cows responsible for producing the lovely Suffolk cheeses. I think they're a lot fatter than the ones you'd find in the 16th century, which were probably pretty skinny beasts, but these girls are producing lovely milk for top quality cheeses. As you can see in this photograph, there is a tendency to wetness. So the Phragmites in the background, these tall reeds are very typical. Uh, ponds at the corner of fields, at the intersections, um, hedges often containing trees, elms particularly, also oaks for, for, for timber, for structure and other timber usage and not too much woodland in this area of very uh, democratic and um, um, very um, prosperous mixed um, yeoman farm. The yeoman farms basically, some would be, cop land would be copyhold, some would be freehold, a mixture and this arrangement has continued through to the 16th century, even from doomsday. Next, please. So here's our farm. The house is a long, thin, red, north to south blob. And the, um, the land that goes with it is edged in red. The green, in fact, greens, and it's a complex system here. Don't want to go into it in too much detail, but that the farm is in effect the base of a narrow triangular green um, and uh, the base of the green being um, on the north side of a, a very narrow arrangement in this case. The, the, the fields here are served very well by the road system because roads are, are very important in a very sticky, difficult landscape where carts will very soon get rutted and there will be problems with mud everywhere. Next please. The same map, the same arrangement, but here I want to focus more on the usage of the fields and the, the, the way that they're divided up. As in, as in many cases, the, the fields can be divided quite straight in a rectangular way. Um, th the map here is of the 1870s, but it records land use in the 1840s. So the green shaded fields are pasture and the yellow are arable. And at this stage in the, um, by the mid 19th century, a lot of the pasture will have been plowed up. The cows will have been killed and there's a much greater emphasis on arable, but I think that the divisions into about five acre blocks may well go back to the Middle Ages in this case. You'll see then that the roads which are, which are filled in orange provide very good access to all the fields on this farm. Now, although it's close to the green, the house is actually facing across the road eastwards towards its main blocks of land. But I want you to notice that the pasture is on the whole clustered around the farmstead. So the cows are kept close to the house, granted that the land is very, very flat. On the west side of the farm, um, the, the level is about 202 feet above sea level. And wow, 
the east side is all of 204 feet above sea level. So you've got a fall of two feet dead flat across the entire farm. Ditches, drainage are everything. Next, please. So a close up of the farmstead shows the farmhouse. Uh, it further extended to the south a little bit until the 19th century. So it was a very long house and I'll explain why later. Then there's a little orchard to the west of the house and a canal, a decorative feature, probably I think inserted in the 17th or 18th century after our period, but a classic example of a decorative feature added by a generation becoming more prosperous between the, the, the orchard and the milking yard, which is to the west, to the left, frequently they're about an acre. This is where the cows come to be milked. This is where the young calves will be beginning their lives. There could well have been um, a netus here, uh, which is a cow shed. Edward introduced that principle where the young calves lived for the first few months of their lives. That's probably in that acre uh, milking yard. The barn is right on the road and the ditch boundary of Blacksmith's Green, alias Weathering Set Green, is to the south of the farm, but the farm is looking east onto its own land. You'll see the ditches there draining the road system and the green, critically important to keep the roads dry and also very helpful to drain the meadows and the arable. Next, please. <clears throat> An aerial view of the farmhouse in the foreground, self-explanatory, I think. The barn in front here by the road is a 19th century one, but it uses smoke blackened medieval timbers from the demolished service end at the left-hand end of the farmhouse. That's important to note, and we'll come back to that in a minute. So the scene is pretty much set, and we can start looking at the house. Next, please. So, the house should be divided in our minds into two. On the left is the first phase dating from about the 1520s. And on the right, uh, what I would call phases two slash three, but perhaps more accurately, question mark phase four. I think it's probably later than the alterations to the open hall house that we're going to look at now. So the second hall uh, and the parlour, a nice big parlour, probably arrived about 1600 during the Great Rebuilding. Next please. <clears throat> so to focus more on the original house of about the 1520s, we have a conventional three cell inline plan with an open hall in the centre. At the right hand end, the uh, so-called parlour cell, although that's questionable as to its use, is jettied at the end of the house, facing north, facing to the right. Why is it jettied? Big question, we'll discuss it. At the left was, I'm pretty sure, a conventional service end consisting of a buttery and dairy, I would imagine, and the roof form of that extension is what we're going to look at in a minute. Why is the roof designed in the way it was, although in this case it's gone? All to be explained. Next please. So here is the original house, three cell open hall house. The left hand end has what we call a half hip roof in which the hip is raised to allow for a window in the loft of this service end room. Then above that half hip is an open triangular gablet designed to extract smoke from the open half. And that again is something I want to talk about in more detail. This is a crown post roofed house in an area which was frequently queen post roofed. These two roofs seem to be an option, queen post roof carpenters, those that would normally build a queen post roof were sometimes asked to build a crown post roof, but you can tell in other ways that these guys were very used to building 
green post roofs. But uh, that's really another subject for another day. We're going to think about smoke dispersal through that gablet on the left. And then on the right, you can see the jetty peering out from under the eaves facing north. Next, please. So let's think about what's typical and what this house exemplifies in East Suffolk, particularly North East Suffolk. And they were deliberately, pig-headedly doing everything different from the foreigners to the south of the Gipping Divide in Southwest Suffolk and Essex. We are in a different world. And to some extent, at least, there's a closer connection with Norfolk than there is with the rest of Suffolk. So we'll just quickly run through this list of uh, features that we're going to be looking at. Crosswinds are not usually found in the late Middle Ages in this part of rural Suffolk. The farmhouses tend to be very rectangular. Studs, there tends to be very little need in their eyes for middle rails. There are no cross wings, but the hall is continued left and right with lofts above service rooms. If you think about it, this might be contentious for some, but we can prove it. People lived in one room right through the Middle Ages, in effect. That was their home. All of life's events took place from conception to death in that one space, the open hall, right through the Middle Ages in this rural area. Albeit that parts of the house were partitioned off, but what their purpose was is a very interesting subject and principally, I think, not so much for life as for work and for storage. Wind braces. You might well be familiar with tension braces, but here we're looking at up bracing, drooping, we sometimes call them up braces, which we'll look at. End jetties are not associated at all with cross wings, and nor are they apparently associated with bedchamber accommodation upstairs. There's something else going on. There's some other reason for all these end jetties, which are not like conventional jetties anyway in other parts of Southeast England. Doorways. They're still using two centered arched Dern doorways into the early 16th century. We see connections with Norfolk architecture here, but don't look for Tudor arched doorways as an indicator of date. They filter in very slowly in the, in the early 16th century in this area. Window mullions may be rectangular as well as diamond. Uh, Edward uh, shot an arrow at me earlier and said we haven't got enough maps showing features to help explain the things that he was talking about. We can produce lots of maps of architectural features which prove that Suffolk north of the Gipping Divide is um, a, a totally different cultural area from southwest Suffolk and more south. So rectangular window mullions occur in this selfsame area as queen post roofs and as many other features in rural mid-high Suffolk. Rectangular mullions are set square to the front wall they are otherwise very similar to diamond mullions. Sometimes a house can have both in different windows. There seems to be a status thought in the choice of rectangular mullions. Might be to do with window shuttering, I do not know. Um, responses would be very interesting. We're looking at thatched hipped roofs, in particular half hips, as I've just described. The roof structure type could in this area be queen post or crown post or coupled rafter, but we often can see which type of roof the particular carpenter was most used to. These guys, many of them for the most modest houses in the 15th and early 16th century were using queen post roofs. Next please. So here's a, a, a little typical 
three cell 15th century open hall house in High Suffolk, with a two bay open hall, a dern doorway, entrance door, a big window in the higher bay of the hall, which could well have rectangular mullions in it. Left and right, little cells, the service cell divided usually into two small rooms, buttery and a dairy perhaps, and then at the higher end, an equally small room that we think of as a parlour. Perhaps some, in some cases there was a bed in there. I'm not convinced there seems to be much flexibility. And then lofts um, under uh, the roof with perhaps a three foot or four foot high side wall. And then the half hip roof that you can see on the 3D drawing here with a window under the end hip. And the blackness shows the way that smoke is um, obviously rising to the ridge, but is then guided in one way or another through to the end of the building to emerge under a gablet. And there can be one at either end of the building, but at Meadow Cottage slash farmhouse, there's only one at the service end and more of that in a minute. Next, please. So I'm going to think about lofts in particular. If people lived downstairs in the early 16th century, which I think is a given, then what were they using the lofts for? And why was it that the lofts were not fully partitioned from the open hall and its source of heat and smoke. So we'll ponder that subject. Next, please. So here's a long section through um, Meadow Cottage with the open hall at the center. As you can see the passages to the right and the upper bay with its window to the left. The service end has been reconstructed in a barn, but we've no reason to doubt that it was half hit. The rafters are there, their smoke blackened, the smoke came through into the chamber over the service. At the opposite end we have something different and I think very instructive. The roof is gabled, not hipped, and underneath the gable is a jetty. I want to look in a, in a minute about the structure of the jetty but you'll see the drooping braces going up to the wall plate, which is normal for this area. There has been a loft floor which has been raised because of settlement. And the window in this front wall is not symmetrical. And instead, there's a central stud with a large mortise facing us. I believe that that's to do with shelving and the shelving would cross the room. In the case of some houses in High Suffolk, certainly at a later period, the shelving runs along the centre of the cheese loft, which indeed this room was. So we're looking at cheese storage above a room which was either a dairy or a parlour. It's unheated for sure. It's certainly been used as a dairy since, but was it designed as a dairy or a sleeping parlour? I do not know. Next, please. <clears throat> so just a quick look at the high-end partition, uneventful, notice the convex drooping wind braces, <clears throat> simple stud work and a crown post roof which has been very adapted since, and a dern doorway which leaves evidence leading into the parlour. Next please. So here is the north elevation reconstructed, although it's become an internal partition next to the later domestic range. The evidence is all there, this is correct. So here's the jetty, but above the jetty is a wall that's only three foot or so high under the eaves. So it's not a living space, it's a loft, and yet it's jettied facing up the road to the north. I see it as a statement that this loft is important, that it is to do with the main source of income from the farm, which is 40 acres in effect of a cheese factory. I think that we should look at this place as totally centered on a dairy herd. And this loft is the main source, uh, is, is the storage space for the main 
source of income. The cheeses on racks, on shelving. Next, please. So I'm looking at evidence for the jetty here with you. This isn't half a doorway on the left. It is a jetty bracket and there is a stub of horizontal structure immediately above the bracket. The floor has been raised by a couple of feet. It was well down, wasn't it, from its present height. Next, please. So here's a little bit of reconstruction to show that there's a post, a corner post. And I think it was Dave Stenning who gave this name to this type of jetty construction. But in the context of the early 14th century or the 13th, but here in Suffolk, they were still doing it in the early 16th century, largely, I think, because there were no middle rails to extend beyond the corner. So it was stubbed onto the end of the corner post and the gable wall was brought forwards, obviously by a foot or 18 inches on the strength of this stub and the bracket underneath it. And it's quite widely found. There are one or two examples as a raised art house with this type of jetty left and right for um, this uh, jetty arrangement underneath uh, a hip roof. It's clearly a mid Suffolk fashion. Next please. So closer in again, um, if you're good at, at structural drawings, you'll see the pegging evidence, you'll see that there isn't any chance of error. This is exactly how it worked. Next please. So here is um, just the enlargement of the long section through the front wall, showing the front wall with the jetty reconstructed. And you can see here the, the mortise for racking going through to the back wall. Um, I guess it was stopped short of the back wall. It didn't, um, it didn't locate with that opposite stud. So you would walk round it and the room in effect was divided into two halves. Next, please. To think of now about smoke in the open hall, and we we the, well, I think what we learn from this is that that the smoke from an open hearth was not wasted, but carefully controlled and made full use of. I'm talking about the heat, of course, rather than the smoke. Usually, um, rather than being lost through a louver in the centre of the roof, which didn't happen in this part of the world it's actually channeled through into areas where it can be used as a secondary function. In this queen post roofed house, it's another house in another part of mid Suffolk. You'll see that, that the partition wall at the high end and the low end is stopped at collar level deliberately to allow heat and of course smoke to go through into the loft at both ends of the house to provide warmth to whatever was in the chamber at that uh, at both ends. Next please. <clears throat> so here we are back in Meadow Cottage and you can see not just the smoke blackened rafters from the open hearth but there's plaster under the battens and between the rafters which is smoke blackened as well. And just as a matter of contrast the cheese chamber on the right has the plaster but is completely white as you would expect because cheeses do not benefit from warmth or from smoke. So is it possible that the plaster is original or is it a later alteration? That's a thought to run with. Sometimes you'll see battens that are still fixed down to the rafters from the original roof, smoke blackened heavily from the open hearth. But in some cases you can see plaster, which is also smoke blackened on top of it. And that to me says two phases. And I think that's what we may have got here. So we'll talk about that. Next, please. Um, if you like this kind of thing, which I do, what's the purpose of the mortises in the underside of this pair of rafters? It's close to the open truss, right at the ridge, obviously, just a foot or so below. Normally speaking, if there is going to be a wooden louver above the open half at the ridge, then 
you would expect the structure to go upwards vertically, but this is for a horizontal feature, a kind of yoke. I think it, it's original to the building, and I think it's doing something unusual that I can't explain. So I'll leave that one in the air. It's interesting. Next, please. <clears throat> windows. We talked about windows. The front wall has oblong mullions in the open hall window. There are three original mullions there. Why were they oblong? Why were so many houses in this part of Suffolk also given oblong windows when the rest of the world was given diamond mullion windows? Indeed, in this case, the cheese chamber back window has diamond mullions, but not the front one. And lots of houses in High Suffolk have a combination of both mullion types. Sometimes there are all oblong mullions. And this goes right through from Choppins, the raised aisle hall at Codnam from the 1380s, right the way through to the late 16th century. Another question, why did they do it? Next, please. So phase two in the last five minutes of my talk. So forget the right hand half of the house. Think with me, please, of the alterations, the conversion of the open hall house. Next, please. Gonna ask a question. There appears to have been a short chimney, a chimney that stopped below the roof and spewed out its smoke and heat into the loft space over the open hall. In this case, it's an insertion, but in many cases, houses were built in the mid 16th century with these short chimneys in the daring area of mid Suffolk. So I'm asking a series of bullet questions here. What's the point of it? And why in this case, does it feature with its back to the cross passage when usually in this part of, the, of, of Suffolk, the, the chimney, the short chimney is built with its back to the high end of the hall. And if it's at the upper end, of course, it destroys the opportunity for a bench for a dais at the high end. This is mid Suffolk. Is it to do with um, uh, the, the um, uh, it's difficult difficult to describe what these people are thinking about, of course, but the feudal system maybe has, has never been strong here. Perhaps in this democratic part of the world, this independent spirit um, discards the idea of a bench. I don't know. But the chimney in this case is backing against the cross passage, or it was. And it discharged into the loft. The smoke went through the gablet over the service end, but in the meantime, warm, warm air is deliberately filling the loft over the hall. And later on, they replace the chimney with a full height one piercing through the ridge. Next, please. So we're going back to this long section drawing. We've seen this drawing before. Here's the open hearth discharging high into the roof and, and then out through the gablet over the service end and warming the loft on the way through for things like, I suppose, seed corn. And I think that would be an important use for a loft, which is warmed on the, as the smoke uh, goes out through the end of the house. Next, please. <clears throat> Instantly, they inserted a loft floor and a short chimney, just like that. So I've shown it diagrammatically uh, in red lines. I hope to make it easier to follow because when they stopped the chimney at a certain height, we don't know where exactly, but it would have been above the eaves level. The smoke then filters through into the loft and the granary is often above the hall in sub-medieval farmhouses. You see that frequently, not just in Suffolk. So we can assume that things that needed to be kept dry and warm, maybe, may, maybe horse harnesses, maybe equipment for the farm, certainly the corn would be kept in this loft. <clears throat> uh, vital, of course, that the seed corn can germinate, having been well kept stored in the correct conditions over the winter. So very interesting, a short chimney, but in an interesting location. Was it that they didn't want to compromise the coolness of the cheese loft at the high end of the house? 
So they put the chimney down at the service end. I don't know. Interesting. Next, please. Just a quick rush through because I must finish. Um, a house which is built with a short chimney from day one. This is a house at Mendlesham nearby. It's about the 1550s or 70s. We'll just go through some self-explanatory pictures of it. Next, please. We're looking at a short chimney. It's at the high end, which is what's more normal. Quite likely there's a kitchen at the parlor end. The window says that's what it was. There's a huge amount of soot encrustation in the loft above that high end room and a huge amount of encrustation in the loft over the hall. So I think there's something going on here, which is not just keeping cheeses, which happened at the service end, but also perhaps they were curing. I don't know, perhaps they were curing meat because of course the male calves would be culled on the whole for the winter and they would presumably also have pigs that they would kill and they would have smoked meat perhaps and perhaps they would even sell it. Next please. So here's the roof of this other house, short chimney house, showing you the kind of smoking crustacean in what is in effect a two-story house, although it's just a loft. You can see the gablet in the right-hand photo, which extracted the smoke over the parlor end. Next, please. So at the other end, a cheese loft with a gablet completely white. It's been gabled in the 17th century, but you can see how the half it would have worked. Next, please. So my last slide, I hope you've enjoyed this virtual walkthrough and I think we've been talking here about a cheese production enterprise with 40 acres of pasture to provide the raw materials, the cattle and the cheese production downstairs, storage upstairs, off it goes to Norwich or somewhere perhaps even further field to the Navy. Um, Suffolk cheeses were the best at least at, at this period I think. So um, from flat, wet, clay, sticky, mid-Suffolk, thank you very much for coming, visiting. Thank you.